Hey everybody, this is John with a, another installment of Think Culture Daily. It's Friday. It's it's a uh, time of leisure. It's a day of leisure. Um, not really impressed by anything in the news. Um, uh, so I thought I would just kind of chill today. <laughs> that's what that's what you come here for. Um, you come to just watch me spontaneously decide to. Uh, um, <laughs> do whatever. I'm going to read actually uh, a portion of uh, an interview with Slaughter Dyke called, um, what's it called here? Let's look, let's look, what's it called? Um, it is called Living Hot, Thinking Coldly. Okay, so that's obviously a, re a reference to Marshall McLuhan. If you're not familiar with Marshall McLuhan, he is a media theorist. Um, Canadian Catholic conservative actually media theorist and uh, he has this idea of hot and cold which refer to the um, he, like the medium of, is the message that comes from Marshall McLuhan and one of the things about media that he discusses is hot and cold hot and cold referring to basically how much um, uh, participation they require from people who are listening, watching, whatever. And he thinks that hot and cold media sort of have different effects on people. So cold media, which are like um, literature, stuff like that, they tend to make you docile, I think basically is the idea. Because you're engaged and you're participating so much, right? You're um, contributing so much, you're, in, you're engaging your critical faculties, and so, as a consequence of that, it's sort of relaxing <laughs> in the sense of, like, you become more aloof. There's less, like, uh, you might say, like, psychopolitical volatility in a society that's dominated by cold media. Uh, the introduction of major cold media has a cooling effect on the temperature of a society, you might say. Hot media is, like, um, the radio or something, right? So, um... And he thinks that, like, radio contributes to the, the rise of Hitler or something like that, right? Because that's just um, one uh, form of sensory input. It's just auditory, right? There's not a lot of participation. Like, where the book, I'm reading, I'm looking at the text, I'm, you know, thinking in my head, I'm imagining, I'm touching the book, you know, all this stuff is going on, right? Whereas with radio, it's just the message is coming in, boom, 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 and there's no give and take. There's no back and forth. I'm not participating. I'm just receiving your message, right? So he thinks that has a heating temperature. The radio is a hot medium, and it causes people to become more volatile, etc. and so forth. So the title of this is obviously a reference to Marshall McLuhan and this hot-cold dynamic, okay? Um, at the beginning of it, they're discussing an essay... I'm not going to read this section, but I figured I would talk about it anyway. They're discussing an essay from Peter Sloterdijk called Rules for the Human Zoo. Okay? And in Rules for the Human Zoo, this caused a scandal in Germany. It uh, caused a break in the relationship between he and Habermas. Habermas, I think, thinks he's a, uh, you know, a fascist or a Nazi or whatever <laughs> as a consequence of it. It's sort of the impression that people had on the basis of this essay, Rules for the Human Zoo. And... Um, the reason for that, they thought that he's talking about eugenics, which is a major taboo in Germany post World War II. Obviously, um, it's not it's not fascistic. He's not a Nazi. <laughs> okay. He's talking about Nietzsche. Okay, so basically the thesis of Rules for the Human Zoo. I may do a video on it sometime, or it and some other essays or something like that. But basically, the thesis of Rules for the Human Zoo is that. Uh, He's talking about the breakdown in this tradition of humanism, which creates friends out of each other. So you can think of Schmidt, the friend-enemy distinction. I think this is part of what he's talking about. So a political community is a community of friends, right? And the polis is founded on this opposition be be between friend and enemy. So the political rests on this distinction between friend and enemy. So humanism is a tradition that creates friends um, locally, temp you know, across time, whatever. And we've mostly conceived of it as a literary tradition. You know, men of letters, they're engaged in this humanistic activity. And it has a domesticating function. He refers to it as domestication. Right? He thinks that we're self-domesticating animals. 
So this is, <laughs> it starts to get in, in that area because we're also self-breeding animals, right? Um, we're domesticated animals, but we don't have a shepherd that breeds us, you know, for uh, eugenic purposes or whatever. Um, but he thinks this tradition of humanism has broken down. He's talking about Heidegger and the letter on humanism in which Heidegger rejects humanism. People like Foucault follow in his footsteps. He wants to say that man is not a rational animal. We're not animal plus some spiritual, rational faculty or whatever. We're not animals at all. We're docile. We're being in the world. That's Heidegger's um, formulation, right? Um, being there. Because we are our world. We, we create the world. For Heidegger, we're shepherds of being. We dwell in the house of being. Um, uh, you know, etc. Right? So we have a, a whole different kind of function in Heidegger. He thinks that the tradition of humanism both treats us as too great and too little at the same time. Um, but in any case, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So in Rules for the Human Zoo, he thinks this humanist tradition is broken down, and he thinks that bestial, human bestialization is a threat. We have to have some kind of self-taming, right? Self-domesticating techniques. So he calls this anthropotechnics. And he thinks of cultures basically as amalgams of friends who are uh, auto-suggestively involved in regulating the temperature. We're in, um, what's he saying? Um, anthropogenic hothouses, right? So these are hothouses that manufacture human beings we regulate the temperature in terms of hot and cold in this kind of Marshall McLuhan way, and we um, we domesticate ourselves, we tame ourselves, right? Uh, you can think about economy, right? Oikonomia, oikos being the household, household management, household rules, etc. So we establish in a, a, a household for ourselves in this hot house, right? And we have to manage. The house. We have to set the temperature. We have to <laughs> establish rules for each other, etc. And there's a hypnotic dimension to this. And um, he talks about that kind of stuff. How there's a breakdown in humanism. So we need to have some kind of technologies for taming, for domesticating human beings. And we can talk about that in terms of politics, politics as shepherding, all this other kind of stuff. He talks about breeding as well. This is where it gets into the eugenic stuff, kind of. Talks about like Nietzsche saying that um, we've bred a very timid, weak animal, a weak form of human being, and he wants to talk about conscious control versus not. Like, should we think about having some kind of conscious um, awareness of in, in, intervention in our the self breeding of human beings, what that would look like, etc. Um, he thinks that uh, the idea that we haven't bred a certain kind of human being is absurd, right? But we've just been doing it sort of unconsciously, and that means there's been just this sort of, you know, biological drift, <laughs> you know? Um, and we haven't had control over this process or whatever, or not conscious control, and maybe we should think about that. So those are things that happen in Rules for the Human Zoo, right? Huge scandal, etc. It's discussed at the beginning of this. And he writes this, or this interview happens in between his writing of the second and the third volume of Spheres. So Globes is the second volume. That's when we have the age of grand narratives, globalization. Um, you know, we have the sort of, self, we have the world macrosphere. Everything is um, connected. There's like one narrative that explains everything one center that unites the world and so on and so forth then in the postmodern era the globe is uh is popped we get foams foams is the morphological metaphor of postmodernity for Sloterdijk um so this interview happens in between these two things and so he's thinking about how we construct our cultural hothouses and what that means and everything um in a world in which now uh, we live in these kind of foams, right? There's, uh, we're not contained in the, the perfect <laughs> sort of macrospheric globular um, sphere. You know, our spheropoiesis is um, is uh, broken down. Like I might not have anything in common with my neighbor now, right? 
especially in the era of, tech, of the internet and stuff like that, right? Uh, anyway, there's a section in this interview that I wanted to read, and I think it's a good introduction, maybe a better introduction to Sloterdijk and his thought in general, than Critique of Cynical Reason, actually. Even though it's just a section of, of one interview, I think it gives a, actually a pretty good introduction to him. So I figured today, on this lazy day, I'll just read this, um, maybe discuss it a little afterward, I don't know. <laughs> maybe not, maybe just turn it off. <laughs> That's what you get on when you tune into Think Culture. It's the quality of, of the show. Actually, the Think Culture Daily, I'm trying to train myself. I don't think I'm that proficient in terms of rhetoric, in terms of public speaking. Although this, this isn't really public speaking, I'm you know, staring into the, the empty, dark void of my microphone alone in my room, just talking, which is, you know, public speaking is easier in a sense because you get feedback, you can see faces and stuff like that at least. Um, so this is a little difficult. As Nietzsche says, you stare into the abyss. The abyss stares back into you. My mind becomes an abyss. <laughs> I lose track of what I'm saying, etc. <laughs> so Think Culture Daily is sort of equally about me and me just trying to become familiar with the medium, accustomed to the medium, more proficient, okay? <laughs> so, so stop worrying so much about what you're getting, okay? You should be grateful you're getting anything. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to go read part of this interview right now, um, and I hope you enjoy it. I think it's very interesting. It's very interesting. This is probably going to become the Slaughter Dyke channel in the future, because I, I like this guy. Um, but here we go. Hopefully you like this, too. Okay, so I start here, and that's why I have it highlighted. But this mere observation that modern thinking is marked by its historicity and that the proper names of the major authors serve us as markers in the chaotic flow of discourses doesn't go far enough. We have to go further and delve into the content and method of a radically contemporary thinking. Hence the following questions. What is thought if one thinks after Nietzsche? And how does one think if one thinks within the sphere of influence and on the horizon of Nietzschean thought? The answer to the first of these questions must indicate why that thought is at the center of modern civilization. For after Nietzsche, one thinks, most of the time without realizing it, the conditions of possibility and the conditions of reality of life. One tries to understand how life, a life, our lives, and our thinking about these lives are possible. And among the answers given to this question, there's one that relates to philosophy. Let us, for the moment, define philosophy as that agency of wisdom whose task is to manage the question of truth within an advanced civilization. I really like this definition of philosophy, by the way, and it relates to the general immunology. The answer consists, which is the project of spheres, it's about general immunology. The answer consists in the proposition that life, a life, our shared life, is possible by virtue of the fact that human beings are endowed with a sense of truth. The sixth sense enables them to live a life more or less successfully and be part of a development. First, because it provides them with the means to adapt to a given environment, accommodation of the intellect to things. And second, because it inspires in them the respect for the rules that make up the religion of the tribe, accommodation of behavior to the divine law. This is also why after Nietzsche, the theory of truth, the old royal discipline of philosophy, transforms itself into an element of an expanded metabiological reflection. Here again, it's tempting to make use of the schema of de-definition. Life and theory are things too important to abandon to the biologist alone. In my recent work, I've said about integrating psychoanalysis, the history of ideas and images, systems theory, sociology, urbanism, etc., into a meta-paradigm that I call general immunology or alternatively sphere theory. If one takes the new definition of life, of a life given by the immunologists at this century's end, according to which life, a life, is the success phase of an immune system, one immediately grasps how these studies lend themselves to a Nietzschean reformulation of the question of truth. From the standpoint of Nietzschean or post-Nietzschean philosophical metabiology, truth is understood as a function of vital systems that serves in their orientation in the world and their cultural, motivational, and communicational auto-programming. At this level, we are dealing with a philosopher-slash-biologist Nietzsche, the author of the famous phrase, we have need of lives in order to live. In the terminology, one would say that the truths, which I shall term first order, 
are symbolic immune systems. Lives are condemned to perform a permanent effort of raising their morpho-immune shields against the microbiological invasions and semantic lesions, we call these experiences, to which they are exposed. Now, I think this way of considering individuals' systems of opinions has moral implications of considerable scope. It teaches not a duty of reserve, but a decision to act with reserve. In post-consensual society, I regard this kind of ethics as indispensable. If we turn now to the second question, that of how, or the methodical approach of a properly Nietzschean thinking, we note immediately that there's a second level in Nietzschean thinking on truth, which is strictly different from the first. Here, Nietzsche is the philosopher-adventurer. He abandons the terrain defined by concern with the vital system and immunitary illusionism, whether that of the individual or the social body. He advances into a region where he discovers second-order truths, the effect of which is indifferent to the vital interests of human beings or worse, which is directly opposed to those interests. There is then a second face of truth. If the first were that of a protective mother, the second assumes the features of the Medusa. Faced with the former, one melts. This is McLuhan again. Confronted with the latter, one freezes. The meta-immune or contra-immune function of the second order truth consequently triggers an internal crisis in the human beings who have ventured too far into these forms of knowledge that transcend life or are definitively harmful to life. One might thus venture that modern philosophy, the philosophy that has killed God, the ultimate expression of the will to be in integrated into an incorruptible space, that's the globe, right? We killed God, that's the globe popping into foams. Um, is the, the, that modern philosophy that does this is the equivalent at the level of cognitive systems of what the doctors call autoimmune illnesses. SoCal and Brickmont can pull out their notebooks here for an augmented edition of their book. Since I don't care, since I don't dare believe they'd accept the invitation to join my seminar on the role of scientific metaphor in the development of cutting edge theories. Thought reaches its maximum degree of discomfort here, for this challenge is addressed to the pride of the animal endowed with logos, the uh, zuon, logon, ekon, right? The rational animal. That's what he's referring to here. Knowing we can think strictly unbearable things, do we for that reason have to give up the adventure of thought because most of these hard truths aren't assimilable as such by human beings, by all human beings? Shall we deduce from this that life should at all costs strive to avoid the truths which are external to it? Midi minuit is the hour of the meeting with the other Nietzsche, with the metaphysician of the artistic function of life who formulated the battlefield for quote, inhuman truths, in two sentences. First, we have our art in order not to die of the truth. And second, let knowledge advance, let life perish. We shan't take this analysis of the conflict between the thinkable and the bearable any further here. There's a very useful book by Rudiger Safransky, Wie viel Wahrheit baust der Mensch? That may serve as an introduction to this particular problematic. I simply point out that this too cursory survey contains all the elements of an answer to the question which, uh, to the question why I may have accorded priority to the earliest Nietzsche, the immunological Nietzsche. It was in fact the young Basil philologist who opened up the battle of the titans of our age around the ascent by showing that the Dionysian isn't in itself bearable that it's life itself that's incapable of bearing itself as it is, and which as a consequence invents more pleasing representations, representations that please us. To use the vocabulary of the birth of tragedy, life transfigures itself. One might say it invests the secondary process. In this connection, who doesn't see that all the principles of Viennese psychoanalysis can be found in the text of the young Nietzsche, including its key word, primal scene, found there in the plural, I don't want to do it again, so... <laughs> Urzenen des Leidens, um, which we might render as the archidrama, ar archidramas of suffering. By way of a rather bizarre mythological apparatus, not well received by Greek scholars, Nietzsche outlines a science that is to come, a science that could bear the name of vitalist constructivism. 
which was recognized at a certain point in the debate around Nietzsche's work under the somewhat mediocre label of active nihilism. It's mainly this hard Nietzsche that interests me, the philosopher who tried to think without any regard whatsoever for the stabilization of his own system of vital illusions. That particular Nietzsche offers a poignant interpretation of his idea that the philosopher is the physician of civilization, for in order to train in that perilous profession, he throws himself into radical experimentation in vivo on the system of illusions on which his life, and perhaps human life in general, is founded. This is ultimately what I mean by the term selbstversuch, self-experiment. What the simply Nietzschean thinkers of a generation more fitted than our own call la pensée du dehors. In my most recently published book, The Second Volume of Spheres, which is on macrospheres or globes, let us not forget the sphere of all physical spheres for more than 2,000 years bore in old Europe the name cosmos, and that the sphere of all mental or vital spheres was called God. I ventured the Peronician proposition, the sphere is dead. I attempted to outline there the program of a vitalist or supervitalist philosophical thinking, that is to say, an introduction to the specifically modern dilemma as it expresses itself in this antithesis. A. We think to immunize ourselves, and here it is the mental immune system that thinks, let us say the individual and collective poetico-hallucinatory system, the immune cogito. That's A. And then its antithesis, B. We destroy or transcend our mental immune system when we think, and it is real, operative, external thought that gains the upper hand there. It thinks, a masterless thinking. This dual model of thought carries far beyond the traditional critique of ideologies into an area beyond the vrai naif and the faux naif. In my view, the famous parable of paragraph 125 of the gay science, in which the death of God is proclaimed, invokes precisely the need to invent a new poetics of immunizing space. This is what general spherology is about. And this can be done only in an exteriority that will forever be radically ahead of any construction of an interior, foams. How shall we console ourselves, we who are the murderer of all murderers, Nietzsche says, by making love, by engaging in politics, by building well-heated houses and planning functional hospitals, which are indeed essential. In the terms of a theory of religion, the probability of encountering God in the world having become much more remote than the opposite proposition. It's necessary to replace divine, heavenly, and private immunity with a technical, earthly, political immunity. I should point out that in my view, this substitution is the hard core of the process of modernization. All this brings us back to the impossible dialogue between Nietzscheans and anti-Nietzscheans. I propose the following scenario. The former, Nietzscheans, warm themselves in life and like or put up with cold in thought. The latter are cold in life and seek to find some warmth in thought. The former have broken the sound barrier of human and humanistic illusionism and no longer, or only indirectly, obey the traditional exigencies of the Lebensfeld. The latter apply themselves to building the new cathedrals of communication, Habermas, and they heat those cathedrals using the pleasant illusions maintained by the neo-humanist, neo-idealist, or neo-transcendentalist schools, etc. This amounts to saying that we don't live on the same isothermal lines. So, I think that's awesome. <laughs> and that sort of lays out... Uh, it also... Um, I think I forgot to mention it at the beginning. Um, uh, this ish, this uh, uh, interview, in, in large part, is responding to the kind of um, confrontation with Habermas, right? And to the conflict they have with one another. And to the kind of appellation that Sloterdijk has received, the stigma that he's received um, in, the, in the world of sort of professional philosophy or whatever, um, uh, who Habermas is sort of the king of, right? Um, uh, it's him responding to this kind of stuff. And so he's saying, right, that Sloterdijk represents this sort of Nietzschean tradition of self-experimentation, right, where uh, it is 
So he says that, you know, he said there are these two Nietzsche's, right? The first Nietzsche is the Nietzsche who says, we need illusions. We need art or life is unbearable. Life sustaining illusions, right? And then the second Nietzsche is the Nietzsche of, you know, idol smashing, believe nothing, destroy all the illusions, you know, constantly experiment in creative evolution forever, imperiling oneself, you know, destroying one's own vital illusions, destroying one's own immunitary complex, as it were, right? And he's saying that the, the, peop, the, the Habermasian school of thought, that kind of philosophy, those are people who cling to illusions in terms of metaphysics, in terms of their philosophizing, etc. They try to warm themselves in the comforting illusions of their neo-humanism, their neo-idealism, etc. Right? He was partially responding to this, as, a, as we talked about, in Critique of Cynical Reason. Right? He's responding to idealism, to neo-idealism, um, and how destructive it's been and how it produces cynicism, etc. And he's saying that Habermas uh, and his ilk they represent this, um, you know, warm, uh, they're trying to warm themselves in thought, and they live cold. They don't have, they don't, they're not engaged in self-experimentation. They're not transgressive. They're not uh, interested. They're not, there's no vitalism there, right? There's no, um, what is it, like Dionysiac materialism or whatever, right? There's no kinicism in terms of the critique of cynical reason. They're sterile. Their lives are sterile. They're boring old buddy days. <laughs> right? And they uh, warm themselves up with the therapy of their these illusions about our ability to somehow obtain to wholeness, uh, you know, communicative rationality, like we can systematize everything. Like they want to get back to the comforting illusions of the macrosphere of the globe, right? They're not they're not prepared to live in foams. They're not prepared for it. Whereas he in the Nietzschean tradition that he is saying that he represents, these are people who are warm in life and they put up with being cold in thought with the with um you know, with having no warmth. He talks about the thermotope and things like that in spheres that um, I'll get into that stuff later when I talk about spheres. But the idea is, you know, he has vital living material. He's not concerned with trying to establish some kind of artificial wholeness or coherence or whatever. He's rejecting neo-humanism. He's rejecting neo-idealism. We need to be uh, real politic, <laughs> you know, in a sense, real politic about self-taming, self-domestication, <laughs> about constructing rules for the human zoo, etc. You know, um, so yeah, that's um, I I think that that's a really interesting interview. I think that's a uh, that's, in my opinion, the best section of the interview. I think the connections to Marshall McLuhan and all this other stuff are very interesting. Um, a lot of food for thought. I still haven't even, I think, you know, plumbed the depths of everything that's going on in this answer. Slaughter Dyke is brilliant. Uh, he's awesome. Okay, stay tuned for more Slaughter Dyke content here on the Slaughter Dyke channel. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, I hope that was of some interest uh, on this chill Friday, this leisurely Friday in which I, um, I just decided to read you a, a segment of, of, a, of an interview that I had. And I think it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. So remember, don't simply react, but think culture. <laughs>